So um, this morning I'm excited to have Rick Johnstone with us. He's the president of Integrated Vegetation Management Partners, and he's going to be talking about creating pollinator habitat on utility and highway rights of way. Um, I was lucky enough to hear Rick a couple years ago when he came here to Columbus and uh, presented for a utility arborist in Ohio. I was really excited by what he had to share and what his organization is doing, and so asked him to come and, and talk with us uh, this morning. Since 2003, he's been the president of the nonprofit uh, Integrated Vegetation Management Partners. And so, Rick, thanks for joining us. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, and give you a presentation on integrated vegetation management and how you can use the proper tools and techniques to improve habitat on basically any type of right of way or really any type of land management uh, issue that you may have. Uh, so let me get right into it. Um, give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I've got a degree in forestry from West Virginia University and I, I served uh, as a system forester for a couple of utilities in in the, the area of West Virginia and Ohio, as well as the uh, Mid Atlantic, and I've been an advisor for utilities and federal agencies. Um, integrated vegetation management. What I like to look at it is, it's a system of managing the plant communities to be compatible with whatever you're trying to manage the land for. And the control methods are the process that you do to achieve that objective, as well as secondary objectives. So if you look at utilities and departments of highway, they're looking for safety, reliability, access, and site distance. But then when you're looking at what agencies, citizens, conservationists might want, there's a lot of other issues that you have to incorporate into that. And probably most on people's minds now is the issue about pollinators. So when you look at what your control methods are, I look at it as the tools in the toolbox. And what you want to do to do IVM is that you want to use the right tool at the right time and don't eliminate anything based on presupposed um, what you like or don't like, but basically what's needed to accomplish the task. Now, I worked most of my career on the Delmarva Peninsula, which is Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. On the western side is the Chesapeake Bay, and the east side is the Delaware Bay and Coastal Bays. It's a very environmentally sensitive area. And what we did was manage it based on different zones of the right-of-way. That down the middle where the conductors are, you want very low vegetation, so you, when those lines sag in the heat, uh, there's no tree to contact it to cause an outage. But then you can allow some shrub species to the side. So you end up with different types of plant communities that benefit a wide variety of wildlife. And so you end up producing songbird habitat. Uh, the raptors will sit on the, on the towers and poles because they're looking for the the rabbits and the voles and field mice and the mammals likewise are going to feed and, and bed on these right -aways. So when you're looking at managing, if you look on the top left on this slide, you see where a right has been mowed. But then as you start managing, you end up with a stable plant community that provides cultural controls where plants are competing for sunlight, water, and nutrients, and they produce their own herbicides called allelopathic chemicals. And so they fight for that niche. And then when you produce the habitat, I like it to compare it to the baseball movie where they were in the cornfield and said, you know, build it and they come. And so in this case, you provide habitat. The birds and the mammals are going to live there and they're going to uh, feed on those seeds that are constantly dropping into the right of way and help manage it for you. Now, what got me interested in how you can restore habitat was this wetland in Maryland where it was a maple swamp and the trees were you know 15 to 20 feet tall so it was actually was treated by air the first time broadcast and then followed up with selective treatments to restore it to a wetland meadow well we started seeing orchids germinating and so I went to the state biologist in Annapolis and I said where are these things coming from there was nothing here but maples and they said, well, we're finding out these plants can lie dormant up to 150 years. And it was usually fire that opened these habitats up because the Native Americans would set the woods on fire to drive game. So they were constantly burning the forest. So you had tall trees and then basically prairie underneath. We don't do that anymore. And the woods is choked with vegetation in the understory. So a lot of these plants need the early successional plant communities to exist. 
with that knowledge, I formed a partnership with the Nature Conservancy back in the 1980s where they had pitcher plants growing in a wetland. And it was being encroached by Phragmites, which is a invasive uh, reed grass. And I told them, if you don't use herbicides, you're going to lose the pitcher plants. So they accepted the idea. We came in, treated the trees and the Phragmites, and then had field tours with the Nature Conservancy and the Heritage Program. And, and they found other rare species that they didn't know were out there. We started documenting it when um, we were doing work with the Delaware Nature Society. This is uh, uh, an area where the right-of-ways cross this Nature Society land, and they serve the resorts along the Delaware Bay, or, or Delaware Coast. So like Rehoboth Beach, Dewey Beach, which have thousands of people coming for the summer vacations. And they didn't want mowing because they said it masticates all the vegetation, tears up the wetland. And they said, we'll have volunteers cut it. Well, you can see how well they did. And I said, well, I'm not going to lose this on the 4th of July when everybody's down there. And I said, we could either cut it and then come back and treat it, or we are participating with U.S. Fish and Wildlife spraying Phragmites in the river crossings with a helicopter. We could treat it with that. They chose the helicopter. But we went, I hired a botanist from outside of the power company from Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage and I asked them if they would document what happens. So this is the plant community, and this is back in 1990, which is the zero. There was one basic herbaceous plant in there, which was the Phragmites. We killed the Phragmites with the herbicides, and in two years, we, you see that almost 60 species of vegetation came back. We did not have to plant anything. And then they used this site as a school education site now, and we provided poles so they could build a bridge going across the creek. You will save money doing this. Uh, this is the actual cost that I had on the Delmarva Peninsula. And the green bars is what we were spending. The red is what inflation would be. Now, for a short period, you're going to spend more money because you can't mow it and come back and wait three years. We were on a three-year mowing cycle. You have to mow it, come back in one growing season to treat it, and then touch it up. But after you get over that initial three-year cost, you will save uh, quite a bit of money over the long term. Now, in working with agencies, this is um, rebuilding a line in New Jersey, and the uh, environmental consultant said you might as well reroute it because you're going through bog turtle habitat. So I looked up what bog turtles need. I met with the biologists, and I said, we need to clear this right away back to its boundaries, and then we'll treat the trees and Phragmites to open it up to a wetland meadow. And the biologist said, well, that's good. That's what bog turtles need. She said, but you have another site where there's swamp pink orchids, and they need shaded wetland. And I said, well, we like to have an open meadow, but we don't need it. We can just mow a path on the left there to set new poles and then allow shrubs to grow and then the shrubs can provide the shade for the swamp pink. She said, I didn't realize you can do this. I said, tell me what kind of uh, habitat you're trying to manage to, and we can help you manage to it. Don't tell us how to do it. Just tell us what you're looking for. So they gave us the permit for redoing that line. Now, if you use herbicides properly, as you see here, on the left is the springtime after the treatment the year before, and then on the right is later that summer. You'll release the wildflowers. But if you don't use herbicides properly, you can cause problems. In this case, you see a dead tree next to the distribution line. They used a herbicide that is soil active, and they used enough that it picked up the, through the root systems of that adjoining tree. Now, that happened because of how the utility bid the work, what I call low-bid contracting, a one-year contract. and they will tell the contractor, we want 90% control, and if you don't get it, you have to come back and touch it up at your cost. Well, they don't want to come back. So when you see on the right-hand side here, right when you're adjacent to a road, easy access, the contractors use the proper rates, you've got good control of the trees, and you've got grasses and forbs coming back. On the left, same herbicides but they up the rate. This is over the mountain where it's not easy access, and they wanted to make sure they didn't come back. So they stayed within label rates, 
but for that situation it's too much and so it kind of looks like it's burned and you end up residual effect where it kills seeds in the soil and does not allow the forbs to germinate now IVM is not new uh, this started with research by Dr. Bramble and Burns near State College Pennsylvania uh, where Penn State is and it happened because deer hunters thought herbicides were killing deer so Bramble and Burns set up test plots and they're still active as of today and they said no if you actually use them correctly you'll improve habitat for wildlife not not take away from it but when you go to different areas of the country people say well that's fine in Pennsylvania what's going to happen here and so I formed IVM partners because there wasn't anybody that was doing research across the country and I wanted to have things set up so I could say okay here's what happens in Arizona here's what happens in Iowa these are the different types of plants you can see and then to have areas where we can take people out and show them the board of directors that we have is a a crossing from universities uh, people who've worked in industry and utilities so that we have a good feel for what we're looking for the first workshop we did was in conjunction with DuPont they own land on the Chesapeake called Chesapeake Farms and they said if you want to do research and have a field tour you're welcome to use our area and so we set up a, a workshop for all the federal land management agencies out of DC as well as Edison Electric Institute and we showed them what was possible one example was here trying to treat Phragmites which is on the left and that's a broadcast treatment with what is called hydraulic spraying Phragmites has uh, becomes a monoculture because it does produce allelopathic chemicals so you want to get rid of the thatch layer so we sprayed it burned it off in the winter and then the next year there's a few sprigs we came in with backpacks and touched it up we ended up with these species coming back in the, that following year after the herbicide treatment so again if you use the right rates you're going to release the native vegetation that led to Eastern Neck Wildlife Refuge asking us to uh, do invasive weed control at on that wildlife refuge and we restored habitat on 140 acres then we put a uh, had a grant with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to show the Pine Barrens of New Jersey what's called the Pinelands Commission they don't allow herbicides for utilities so we took an area just outside and we treated it and again it had trees and Phragmites in the wetland you can see the dead canes on the left and on the right you see fern and the dead uh, canes of the trees that were treated this was interesting because we released a rare plant rose pagonia orchids we had thousands of orchids germinate but only where we sprayed herbicides on uh, the adjoining areas with still trees and Phragmites so oftentimes people will say well we don't want you to use herbicides because we don't want you to damage something that's here and I said well you don't understand what might be here if we got rid of the competition now for utilities the electric there was a blackout in 2003 in Ohio that cascaded and caused 50 million people to lose power in the Northeast that cost about 8 to 10 billion dollars several people died because of the loss of electricity and that prompted the US and Canada to order more regulations and so the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission drafted through the what's called NERC uh, FAC 003 regulations that if a utility has an outage from trees they could have prevented they could be fined up to a million dollars a day and so they are clearing their right of ways back to their boundaries and the cutters like a uh, Kershaw cutter on the left which can cut pretty large trees and bush hogs um, are, are needed to get this into uh, the first stage of reclamation but you don't want to rely on mowers because there's a difference between management and maintenance if you maintain something you're controlling the growth to provide a service where in management you're going to change the type of vegetation that's there to be compatible with what you're trying to do now if you look if you look across the country mowing is very difficult to do on steep mountain slopes those areas they can't mow they're going to be hand cutting and they're using these what are called 
brush saws, which basically it's a circular saw at the end of a fiberglass pole, kind of like a weed eater, only on steroids. And they're going to hand cut that on very steep slopes, which is really dangerous when you have snow and ice, uh, which we get in the, in the winter and the higher elevations. If you cut all the vegetation off during the growing season and you get a heavy rain, there's nothing to prevent erosion and sedimentation down streams, particularly if you don't have a riparian area to buffer it. Whatever's being washed down is going to affect the fish and mammals that are using that water. Mowers rut wetland soils. They leave tire tracks and they last a long time. Mowers leak hydraulic fluid. Uh, those mower uh, bases are being jostled on those uneven terrain. They're leaking hydraulic fluid, they're leaking oil, they're leaking fuel. So people will say, well, but we don't want to use any chemicals, so we don't want herbicides. And I said, well, go look in the wetland after a mower goes through and you'll see an oil sheen on the water. You're getting chemicals. So sometimes people say, all right, well then hand cut when you hit there. Well, what do you use every time you put in gas into a chainsaw, you put in bar chain oil. You cut an area of dense vegetation like I showed that maple swamp, you'll put about a gallon to a gallon and a half of oil on every acre, which can contaminate a million gallons of water. So you're polluting air and water uh, with the oil and, and the noise and the discharge of uh, carbon dioxide. Same thing with mowers. You talk, everybody talks about greenhouse gases and, and uh, carbon footprint. But they're okay with mowing. And I'm like, well, what do you think we're burning? They're hydrocarbons. And you see that being spewed out on the back of a mower. Mowing also opens the right of way up for the short term that allows off road vehicles to come in, which upsets a lot of property owners because they're tearing up the soil. And if you don't mow the right time of year, wildlife has a hard time getting out of the way of 3,000 RPM blades. On the left is a turtle after mowing. On the right is a, is a mallard's nest in the right of way, which is going to get crushed by the uh, heavy equipment. And what do fawns instinctively do when danger approaches? They lie low in the, in the grass. Mower operators can't see them until it's too late. So a mowing operation is not real kind to wildlife. But if you're looking at what you're trying to do for vegetation, you haven't controlled anything. You cut the top off and most of the species, particularly hardwood species, are going to sucker sprout. So where you had one stem, you're liable to get 10 or 15. And that will block your access, whether it's gas or electric. And when you have a, a power outage and people are like, well, why is it taking eight hours to get power back on? Well, you have to take a bulldozer back into this right away to open it up. What you want to do is manage it so it looks like this. And you can provide not only the uh, access, the reliability and safety on the right-of-ways, but you're meeting all these other needs. And the other issue for people to understand is that, you know, our transmission grid is a homeland security issue. We, we can't afford to lose our power grid. But you can also do... Uh, environmental stewardship and in particularly the western states of the US and Canada is um, help fight wildfires where those right of ways can act as fire breaks if they're managed. Now I apologize a little bit this is I put these together on on a Mac and then change them to PowerPoint which kind of shifts things around so sometimes words get covered up but this is in Michigan with a Metro Park and ITC transmission which is an electric company. And it was a park where they always topped the trees. And I called it their bonsai forest because they would just top it and, uh, and everything came back again. I talked to the superintendent and I said, you know, we could clear this. What would you like to manage for? And he said, well, this was a uh, uh, oak savanna. This is where the glaciers stopped. We'd like to show people what used to be here. So we cleared the right away. And on the right, you're seeing a, an ATV, which is actually broadcasting herbicides to take out different species. And so on the left is when it was getting ready to be cut in this in early spring and on the right is two years later where the trees are controlled and the forbs have germinated. Um, we also ended up seeing a rare Blanding's turtle 
in this right away that came back because they need an open wetland ecosystem. They, the park wanted to control Canada thistle and spotted knapweed. The spotted knapweed is the pink colored flower on the right. On the left is the right of way. So when I showed us broadcasting, we were using herbicides that would take out Canada thistle and spotted knapweed. And so you can basically draw a line down the edge of the right of way where we sprayed and where we did not spray. We also brought Bob White quail back. I kicked a quail out of this site, and the superintendent said, where'd you see quail? We haven't had quail in eight years. I said, you haven't had habitat. They need early successional habitat. In the wetland, uh, again, they were topping the trees. When I approached the superintendent, he said, take as many as you want. These are Norway maple, which is invasive, and it's uh, supplanting our native sugar maple. So we took the trees out and some trees we topped and then we killed them where they stood so that we could end up with um, some standing trees. Uh, the, some of the logs were dropped for habitat for snakes and salamanders and you see all the vegetation germinating in the full sunlight. And then the tall trees remained to provide habitat for uh, Indiana bats and, and, and other mammals that would use these uh, dead snags for roosting and uh, and flying from. So the park liked it so much that they put up signage on a nature trail to explain to the public how they were participating with the utility and partnering to improve habitat. We had another site um, down near the Detroit River which was invaded by trees and autumn olive and buckthorn, European buckthorn. So this is when it was being mowed, and then we split the right away in two. On the left, we herbicide treated. The right, we left it as a control. This is two years after herbicides. The, my botanist is uh, roughly six feet tall. He's down there near the tower documenting the plants. And on the control side, you can see his white hat on the left. So that gives you an idea of two years of growth without herbicides. And then we documented. So it was cut in 2006. And we're and this is graphing the desirable vegetation. The mowing only had roughly 15% of what we wanted. The herbicides, 90% of what we wanted. You add two more years to it. And after four years, you can see on the right, if it doesn't get cut, they, they have a threat of a power outage. And on the left, you're basically back to the native prairie type of habitat. In the mid-Atlantic, this is in Baltimore. This is uh, Baltimore Gas and Electric in a community called Columbia. It's just outside of D.C., um, right outside of the D.C. Beltway. Now, people were used to the utility mowing the accessible areas twice a year. And they said, well, those are grass areas. And I said, well, they look like grass, but it's mostly invasives. But they were okay with the mowing, and that's a nature trail that crisscrosses the right-of-way in the, in the foreground. In the wet areas where trees had grown up, and they couldn't get mowers in there routinely, same thing with ravines, they had to cut down trees to get in compliance with the new regulations. While everybody went, were upset when they cut down the trees, even though Baltimore Gas and Electric is a utility that owns the land in fee, uh, they don't have a right of way. They actually own it, but adjoining property owners consider it their land. Now, I always like to say in every community, there's the little old lady in tennis shoes. Well, that's Elaine, and she is the spark plug to make sure things are happening in that community. Um, when BG&E wanted to try to broker an agreement, they asked me to help, and Elaine's husband, David, uh, had worked for Audubon, and he heard me speak about what we did on Eastern Neck Wildlife Refuge on the Chesapeake Bay. And he said, well, if they could do it on refuge, they should be able to do it here. So they were in favor of us intervening. And what we recommended is they put up signage first to explain to people what we were going to do. And then we had a community meeting so that we could, I could show them slides of what to expect, and they could ask questions. One of the things I told them is, some of the vegetation, because it's so tall, this is two years after cutting, and it is mostly Atlantis, Tree of Heaven. And some of those were 18 feet tall in two years. 
So we're using the hydraulic technique to, because you have to get to the top of the tree to make sure you take the terminal leader out to kill it. There's a nature trail in the foreground, and I told them in the presentation, the first spring after we treat, it's going to look like hell. But give us a growing season. So th this slide shows right after it's treated. And of course, you can't tell anything right when it's treated because the herbicides act activate slowly. But this is what hell looks like in the spring. <laughs> right? But that's at the end of the growing season. And we didn't get anybody complaining because they anticipated it. So communication is a big step in, in an integrated vegetation management program. You have to let people know what you're doing and why. Here's the wetland area that was cleared on the uh, upper left. And we treated that with backpacks. And on the right, you see uh, swamp milkweed and, and other native vegetation that is not going to cause a problem for the utility. They also have a gas pipeline on this right away. And this is when it was cleared. And the, in, the, in the middle of that slide is a worker who is herbicide treating. That's a sycamore tree he's treating. It's 12 feet tall in one growing season. And there's a little bit of weight because we're using a product called Thinvert. Uh, this is at the end of the growing season, to give you an idea how it restores. Uh, the Thinvert, you see it sticking on the leaves. And in this case, we wanted to retain this Kusa dogwood that they had planted along the roadside. Um, Roy Johnson is a gentleman on the left. He's 85 years old. He developed this product. And what it does is it encapsulates the herbicide in a thin paraffin oil. And so there are no drift. When you get drift, when you put on spray with higher uh, pressure, you'll get what are called fines. Real fine droplets will move. Uh, you can also get volatility if you use uh, certain types of herbicides. Well, with this encapsulating it, it it'll, the entire pattern will move. There are no fine droplets where you get drift. And it'll stick to the leaves. So when you when it sticks to the leaves, it acts as a surfactant or an adjuvant. And you see on the left, on the leaf, leaf surface is a very much of a waxy coating to keep from losing water. And it'll bead up just like uh, water on a waxed car. So the surfactant will break down that layer and allow the herbicide to penetrate the leaf. Uh, and if you're in the hot climate, like in the western states, you, if you spray with 15% uh, humidity, the water's going to evaporate immediately, and you're going to see a, a salt on the leaf. That'll be the herbicide. It, it, the amine formulations are salts. The plant can't absorb it as a salt. It has to be a liquid. So with Thinvert, it'll stay moist much longer and allow the plant to take it in, and you'll get better efficacy with, letter, with less herbicide. So here's that same roadside you see on the left before we started. And on the right is after it was cut, re-sprouted, and then we left the dogwood. And then we will leave an area as a control to use again for educational purposes. So you see here two growing seasons, and that is autumn olive primarily coming up in the control area. And then after four years, it was mowed, and then we show how it sprouts back. And then if you look at a slide, the red is the trees and invasives taking over. It's mowed in 2013. You'll get a response of the forbs for one year, and then the invasives will take over again. On an IVM, you don't completely eliminate them. They're in the, in the understory, but they're under control because the forbs and the grasses are dominating. And this is a side-by-side -side to show you what that looks like which is what we show people on the workshops. And I'll basically say, on the right is just cutting, on the left is cutting plus herbicides. Which one do you want? We can, we can pick and choose. Now that the public knows what's possible, you see people walking on the nature trail. Up on the hill, there's a couple of workers with backpacks. that They're herbicide treating right while people are walking. It's not a big issue once it's under control. And then I had them put up uh, education signs along the nature trail because about 2,000 people a day walk these trails. And it's good for particularly educating the school kids to let them see what, what was going on. Um, when they need to do pipeline maintenance, they don't have to send bulldozers or mowers in. 
because the right of way is accessible. So here's when the when the initial treatment was being done, and that was, they were broadcasting with a tractor in the in the background, and then this is what it looked like a year ago. So the public is now praising the IVM because of the habitat restoration. So it went from a complaint to a positive PR issue, and now when we're looking at pollinators, here's what it, part of that right away used to look like when it was constantly being mowed and it is now a milkweed grove. The milkweed just came in on its own and continues to spread. So the pollinators are benefiting on that right away by the type of management. And again, on the field workshops, because we're so close to Washington, D.C., uh, this particular workshop, we had about 50 people from the U.S. EPA. We have a similar partnership near Annapolis, Maryland. It's called a South River Greenway. And uh, there's a number of groups involved with this. Um, when it was cleared, it was a PR outrage. It was on TV in Baltimore. It was in the newspapers in Annapolis. And uh, I met with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they said, we would like to manage this to improve habitat for songbirds and pollinators. They were okay with using herbicides. They did not like what I call conventional herbicide treatments, where the utility, again, like I showed with that distribution lines, do a low bid broadcast treatment. And in this case, when they go low bid, they're probably going to use uh, glyphosate, you know, Roundup, Rodeo, and Arsenal, because both of those are now generic and they're relatively cheap. The problem, it's nothing wrong with the herbicides, but if you broadcast, you're taking out things you don't need to take out, such as viburnum shrubs in the wetland. So we stopped them from doing that and told them in the wetlands and along the border zone of the right-of-way and in the ravines, you're going to use backpacks and selectively treat. So here you can see along this log uh, three years where, you know, we're doing selective and you get a very stable plant community to hold the soil. Fish and Wildlife, again, wanted to get rid of invasives such as Phragmites. So on the left, they're treating. On the right is uh, two years afterwards. And basically, we restored the native wetland ecosystem simply by using the proper herbicide techniques. Some of the upland areas we broadcast, again, because they were invasives. So they're treating on the left. And on the right, you could see milkweed in that same spot where previously there were sycamore trees. And then you end up, again, with two different plant communities, kind of a prairie down the center shrubs on the edges and then in the ravines. So you're improving habitat. Fish and Wildlife has in Audubon documented 120 species of birds. Uh, some that are threatened, such on the upper left is the prairie warbler. Uh, they also were glad to see wood thrush. And Fish and Wildlife is saying that even the interior dwelling species of birds will use these right of ways to come out and get food for their young. So they're coming in there for the grasshoppers and the caterpillars that they're going to find on those right of ways. Um, there's a B team, which is New Jersey Institute of Technology, Rutgers University, um, U.S. Geological Survey, EPRI, and working with us. And they documented 145 species of native bees and 40 species of butterflies and moths. On this workshop, I'm on the right in a dark green shirt, and next to me in the white shirt is uh, Rich Mason from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and he's explaining the benefits of this right of way. We also had Sam Drogi, who's the pollinator expert with U.S. Geological Survey, and somebody asked, well, what kind of habitat do we need in Maryland? And he said, well, most people think we need more forest. He said, we have more forest than we had 100 years ago. What we don't have is prairie. We've got like less than 1% of what we used to have. And you're standing in probably the best prairie habitat in the mid-Atlantic. That's two years after herbicides, after we cut it and then treated it. So you can see how quickly you can restore it. One of the groups that came to the workshop was the Maryland Public Service Commission. And when they see what was possible with herbicide treatments, they now make that a stipulation. If you're going to build a new line in Maryland, you have to manage with IVM afterwards. And this is a a windmill project in Pennsylvania that was tying into the grid in, Bar in Maryland. And so we had crews doing the treatments for them on that uh, generator lead line coming from the windmills. Um, the windmill company liked it so much, they asked me to 
put together plans, which I'm doing right now for all their windmills, which includes Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Illinois, and California. U.S. Fish and Wildlife asked if we could do the same thing at Patuxent Wildlife Refuge, which is right outside of D.C. It's the National Research Refuge. They used to have to periodically cut and maybe basal treat. It's 200 acres of right-of-way that runs uh, through that refuge. And we did multiple treatments. Now, one of the things is that the refuge manager did not want it mowed first because of the destruction of habitat. He said, can you treat it without mowing? I said, we can, but we'll have to equip the, the uh, tractors uh, to, to raise that sprayer up above so that we can uh, treat it basically like a helicopter would. And um, we did things that a utility wouldn't normally do, uh, meaning that on the left you see the broadcast treatment of the trees on the, on the border zone, but in the middle was uh, Cerecia lespedeza which the, was originally planted for wildlife food, but it's not that good of food, and the refuge wanted to get rid of it. So we broadcast to take it out, as well as fescue, which uh, was also not a good wildlife plant. And that is restored to native warm season grasses and forbs. And you can see here, we graphed how the Lespedeza changed back to native grasses and forbs. So again, it doesn't take very long. Here we're treating with hydraulic, uh, autumn olive, uh, as well as uh, Lespedeza and calorie pear, which is another invasive tree in that area. And again, we graft it. Now I do note uh, dead and bare soil. We keep track of that because people sometimes say, well, we don't want uh, anything dead sta standing up. And I said, well, the dead vegetation and the bare soil is where your native bees will, will nest. But with that, you'll then release it so that things like milkweed can germinate. Here we're taking out another invasive, mile a minute weed. We did it on the right-of-way, and we actually did it outside the right-of-way to assist the refuge because we had the crews and the proper herbicides. And that uh, partnership approach worked in the refuge where there were holly trees that were originally left right under the transmission line. I said, we're not going to be topping trees. So they said, go ahead and spray those and manage for low growing compatible vegetation. Then we had areas where we had a lot of shrubs. We just selectively took out with backpacks so that we had all those shrubs left for wildlife. And um, this particularly was an area where the refuge wanted to research um, primarily for out west, where you would have wildlife that doesn't like openings, such as cougars elk, they don't want too much of an opening to cross a right-of-way so that we could have a, a wildlife corridor crossing. And then this is what I mentioned about the bees. Uh, some utilities, they'll treat and then they'll want to come back the next year where they say the public is complaining about the aesthetics. But those are the canes where you'll see the holes where the bees are boring into it. Much better habitat than these artificial bee condos which usually end up having wasps in them instead of bees and again we partner to control the invasives take those out and manage that right away in the refuge as a healthy ecosystem trees that were too close again you can top them and leave those for bats and other animals that will roost in those uh, dead trees uh, here's another research where we're broadcast to try to get it back to prairie. And then with the backpacks, we follow up to keep it that way. So when you do a broadcast treatment, you really need to do, if it's dense vegetation, one time. Get it restored, and then you could go selectively. And here's that exact issue. They're broadcasting on the left. On the right, you can see how it's under control. We then keep it with backpacks, and this is the type of habitat and you see the bumblebee enjoying it. We started some documentation last year. This is Duke Energy down in North Carolina. We have partnered with Bear Crop Sciences. They're supporting our research in eight states. One of them is North Carolina, and this is when they were doing the treatment in 15, and then on the right is April. And even though it was early in the spring, you see milkweed germinating under the dead vegetation that was treated and wildflowers coming in in their place. 
Now, electric, I mentioned the natural gas on BG&E. Let me give you a little more in-depth on gas. Gas is not much different than electric. They haven't been managing their right-of-ways. I'd say 95% of gas companies mow. One of the problems with mowing is the guys who op sit on the mowers don't like to get hit in the head with branches, so they move over from the edge of the woods. And over time, you could end up what you see here. The right-of-way is on the left, but the pipe is on the right going through the trees. So some gas companies have had to come in and re-clear, find their lines, and then re-clear them. And again, mowing and hand cutting is what's primarily done. But you don't affect the root system. Now that's a big issue with pipelines. And even though they're on a three-year mowing cycle, here's some dead stumps that continue to sprout. So you may have 30-year-old roots. Well, because that soil is disturbed, there's moisture, there's nutrients, it's warmer because of the friction of the gas going through the pipe, roots are attracted to it. And you can see them in the springtime if you fly over them. You'll see where the pipes are because it's uh, more moisture. Well, those roots can get down and corrode the pipes. Now, we had an issue. This is on a, a naval midstream pipeline in Arkansas. There was a pine tree growing too close to the pipeline. And lightning struck the pine tree, set the woods on fire. The fire department put out the fire, and then fire shot out of the ground, and they realized there's a pipeline under there. On the left, you can see a hole in the pipe. The root system was up against that pipe, and the electricity from the lightning discharged into the pipe and blew a hole in it. So, you know, you, you could be, a lot of people don't understand there's even a right-of-way going through their property until the neighborhood blows up. And I realized something was wrong. So we put a partnership together with the Army Corps of Engineers and Columbia Gulf Natural Gas down in Nashville, Tennessee. They said that the Army Corps wouldn't let them use herbicides. So they used to have to hand cut this. This is on an island, about five acres of land. And I asked the Army Corps, let me go back to that, why they didn't want them to use it. And they said, well, they wanted to use the herbicide picloram or toured on, and they wanted to treat by helicopter. And I said, well, I would have told them no. This is a recreational lake. You've got people fishing and uh, boating, camping. Um, the vegetation is too tall. It'll stand there dead for a while because you don't get much snow and ice in Nashville. And that herbicide is not registered for water, nor should you use it in karst soils where you have limestone because it can get in groundwater. But we have herbicides that can work but we need to manage it properly. So this is what it looked like, and we had it mowed first because there was no access. So the mowers cut the vegetation, and then we came back and treated it with an ATV broadcasting after one growing season. And we got pretty good control of that first treatment. And I gave a talk at one of the meetings with Edison Electric Institute and the contractor, Progressive Solutions, uh, President Lee Atkins was there, and he said, I like what you guys are doing. If you need any help, let us know. And I said, well, I, I would like to follow this up with a backpack treatment. He said, you buy the herbicides, and I'll bring you a crew. So they did the treatment for us, and you see it treating on the left and on the right as a year later with our botanist documenting it. And that's how, basically, that's the same site that we controlled it. We released the state flower of Tennessee, passion flower, uh, good food for uh, quail and turkey, wild Virginia wild oats. And so this is what it looked like before treatment, and that's what it looks like now. And you see all the milkweed there that has germinated. Again, we don't plant. This is all coming in naturally. So your pollinators will benefit by the management. We then took them out on the mainland to do some demonstrations uh, outside that lake. And uh, I gave a presentation at one of the conferences, and a lady from FERC was there who manages pipelines. And she said, if you could stop mowing and manage, it would stop 95% of the complaints that we get about gas. So this is that mainland the spring after it was treated. And we showed that if you stop mowing in one growing season, you will double the number of forb plants that are growing because you keep topping them. So then we did a demonstration where we, we sprayed where the pipe is to take out anything tall growing, and even things like Johnson grass that gets eight feet tall and is invasive. So we would have a pipe zone, border zone, 
And with that different type of plant community, you've got things like wild turkey coming out on the right of way feeding. And then you end up with this, where they need to see their pylon markers under the DOT and FERC regulations, but we can allow taller growing forbs and shrubs in between the pipes. So again, you can have that same type of thing we talked about on electric. This is a right of way that was just mowed, but mowers are only going to cut the floor. That doesn't take care of the sight distance of the vegetation on the sides. With herbicides, you can treat the sides by targeting them with the wand here with the backpack crew. We can map it out on GIS. We know where the water is. We know where the dense vegetation is. We can adjust based on what we're expecting. And we can meet other regulations such as um, pollution discharge regulations. FERC allows in wetlands to cut 10 feet where the pipe is and then only cut on the side when it reaches 15 feet tall, which I don't know why that they have that. It doesn't make much sense for management. But the problem is it doesn't talk anything about the invasive plants that might be growing along those wetlands, which oftentimes those streams become the vector to spread it because they're dropping the amount of seeds that they produce into the water, which then goes downstream. So here's where we did uh, a site in, again, this is in Arkansas. We treat it on the left, and we do uh, make sure there's nothing tall where the pipe is, but we're allowing uh, some alder bushes and viburnum to grow off the pipe on that edge effect. Enable Midstream is documenting it that they're going from a three-year mowing cycle to a three-year herbicide IVM treatment cycle. It will cost them $200,000 more per year to make that transition. But here shows on, on a hill overlooking the LaForce River, on the left when it was cut and on the right was just last month or earlier this month, how quick the vegetation grows and how much denser it gets. You see this is three, three growing seasons. That sweet gum was basically in, in the middle with a maple and then on the right three years later is taking over the right of way, blocking access. So here's where we were doing uh, treatments and control sites. On the left was when it was mowed. On the right, what it looks like this month. And they're showing that by doing that, they'll spend 200000 more for three years, and then they will save 500000 a year from then on. Pretty good uh, payoff. Under the federal strategy on pollinators that the president signed in 2014, the agencies are supposed to work with utilities and right-of-ways to use IVM and pollinator-friendly practices. One of the things in most of the cities is that they have grass height ordinances. Utilities have to keep it mowed. Well, this is one in inner-city Baltimore, which when you get into these minority districts, these schools can't afford to take their kids on field trips, and I'm saying... In this case, there's a school at the two spans down on that right-of-way. Stop mowing. You see milkweed growing in the middle there, and they will have a place that they can use existing right-of-ways to take kids on field tours and show them the butterflies and the, and the native bees and the birds using that type of habitat. But you have to allow them to get away from uh, the grass height ordinances. Now, a lot of people want to plant. Now, this is Ohio State has a pollinator demo planting on a first energy right away at their Mansfield site. The planting is expensive, though. People think, well, we have to plant, but you have to maintain it. Otherwise, uh, invasives are going to take over. Uh, and working with the highway system, mowing is a dangerous proposition. You see the mower on the left there. They have to block it. This is Interstate 95 in Maryland. Uh, I worked with Delaware DOT um, years ago when I was at Delmarva Power. They said, we would like to reduce mowing and manage like you're doing your right-of-ways to the, our native vegetation. So right now we're making recommendations to the DOTs. Don't mow so much. You have to mow down to the swale. So you got roughly you know, 15, 20 feet, probably no more than 30 feet off the macadam where you're going to mow. But a lot of the DOTs will mow all the way back to the fence because they own back to the fence, which might be 100 yards off the road. Well, this is a site in Florida where we have a demo. We're, we're doing a case study. 
we've documented that there are actually 41 species of plants growing on that right away, but they get their heads chopped off seven times a year with mowers. So we're documenting, so just stop mowing and then come in with backpacks and take out what you don't want. This is a site in uh, near Talladega, Alabama. Again, they, they need to mow right there coming down to the swell, but where that sprayer with the backpack, he's standing basically at the ditch line spraying back into the right of way. That whole back edge back to the woods can be habitat. And smaller roads, uh, you see on the right hand side on the bottom, that's a road winding through Pennsylvania. Again, there's milkweed growing in there. Just stop mowing and managing it. And if there's a utility line next to it, that can be partners. We just put together one a week ago uh, near St. Michael's, Maryland on the Eastern Shore with Chop Tank Electric Cooperative and the Maryland State Highway Administration. Again, they're, they're stopping mowing along their road right away, and then we're using the utility right away to add acreage to pollinator habitat. Other areas besides right of ways. Um, top left is a uh, county landfill in Maryland. They wanted to get rid of Lespediza and invasives, which we're doing there with backpacks. On the bottom is a restored Superfund landfill that is now managed by the Wildlife Habitat Council as a nature center. On the upper right, you see Lespediza is brown where we treated it, and our native wildflowers are in bloom. And on the bottom is the result the following year. This is a site that used to be the Department of Defense. It was the dairy farm for the Naval Academy in Annapolis. It is now primarily an organic farm for pasturing but it was being taken over by calorie pear, which you see the guy spraying there, and um, autumn olive and other invasives. U.S. Fish and Wildlife asked us to help manage that so they would have native habitat. The, uh, when you're doing treatments in, in the U.S., the State Departments of Agriculture will tell you what kind of restrictions you would have. And they said with organic, you would have to stay 25 feet away from the pasture. Fish and Wildlife said, no, that's too much. We don't want all those invasives that, that 25 feet. They'll keep spreading. They said they're going to use Thinvert. Where there's no drift. And when they showed fit the Department of Ag, they said, okay, give us a five-foot setback, which is what you see on that picture. So we took that um, with spraying and also what we call hack and squirt, where we make an axe cut or a machete cut on the trunk and spray herbicide into the cut on the taller trees and kill them where they stand. If you look at right of ways across the country, there's actually about 60 million acres of land, electric, natural gas, highways, and railroads. On the left is the electric grid on the upper part. On the bottom in the blue is the natural gas grid. You're crisscrossing all the flyways of the songbirds and the monarch butterflies. We can provide excellent habitat by taking advantage of that, partnering with other groups, which we did with Pollinator Partnership and the Wildlife Habitat Council, to impact that positively without planting. This is a brochure that I, the Pollinator Partnership has on their site, with their website, that I, I was the chairman of to have uh, NAPSI use that and recognize right away as beneficial. So on our website, we've got some examples of these case studies. Um, again, we're looking for other partners. If you're interested, uh, let us know, and we'd be glad to work with you. Thank you. Great, Rick. Thanks so much. Uh, folks, when Rick gave me his PowerPoint, he had 269 slides, and I said, well, it'll, it'll be great to watch this. He said, don't worry, I go through so many of the images. So um, thanks, Rick. Nice presentation. Um, I want to ask the first question, since you've been on the Mansfield campus, so we have two um, rights of way there on campus. We have one area that's just mown. It's the entrance, the main entrance to campus. Um, what's your recommendation for turning something that you know seems like pretty solid um, grass into that habitat? Are you doing um, kind of a, a kill back on that and then letting the native seeds germinate, or are you just stopping the mowing and see what what natives uh, can compete? We usually would stop the mowing 
uh, and give it a growing season. See what comes in. And then uh, if, if you have something like uh, fescue, you would want to treat to take that out. Um, we have herbicides that will, that will attack, uh, like I mentioned, the um, uh, spotted knapweed and Canada thistle. Uh, newer herbicides like uh, amino cyclopyrichlor, which is from Bayer, amino pyrolid, which is from Dow. Uh, so some of those we would use. Um, I am looking down. I see a question relative to what herbicides and uh, neonicotinoids. Um, just to let you know, neonics are in insecticides. And what happens is people will throw everything in and say, don't use any pesticides or herbicides. Well, an herbicide is a pesticide but it's attacking plants. That's the herb part of it. Um, neonics are insecticides. So we don't, they're not in our herbicides. The herbicides that we use, we're targeting vegetation that is not really good for pollinators. I mean, oak trees are, but you can't have oak trees in right away. Um, we're going to take out vegetation and we're going to allow vegetation that will provide the flowers that provide the nectar and the pollen for the pollinators. So it's a benefit to them. We're not, um, when you get into uh, affecting pollinators, it would be if, you're if you have things that are flowering and you're going to broadcast treat, well, you don't want to broadcast treat right when it's being, right when they're in the big flowering season and all the bees are on there because you're going to kill the flowers. Um, but again, it depends on what herbicide is used. If you use something that's not selective like Roundup, you're going to kill anything basically green. Um, we, we only use something like, and we don't use Roundup, we'll use Rodeo, glyphosate that's registered for water, in the wet areas, and we do it selectively. And Rick, that kind of goes into Georgian's question is, have you looked at any issues uh, related to herbicide runoff into streams and rivers? Uh, the issue about runoff, again, depends on what you're using, how much you're using. Um, we're using very low rates that they, like I showed, things like Thinvert that will stick to the leaves and is translocated inside the plant. Um, we, we really have not had any issues with runoff. You will get that, like if you use something like I mentioned Picloram that I said I would not use in the water or near water, is because um, you can get it in the soil and then the soil will run off. Uh, you know, where you have sediment and it's clinging to the soil. So something like Tordon in the soil will move and then it can it could do damage downstream. Something like Rodeo would not because it binds so tightly to the soil particles that once it's in soil, plants cannot pull it back off. Uh, so it depends on what herbicide you're using. Um, again, when we're by water, we're only there's only three herbicides registered. Glyphosate, amazapir, and triclopyr in amine formulations that we can use right next to water or in water like we do with uh, Phragmites. And I see the question on Phragmites. That, okay. yep. that we, I like to use a combination of glyphosate and amazapir um, rather than just glyphosate. We, do, we get better synergy between those two herbicides. Okay. 